All right. Good, good morning, everyone. I'm Madeline Brahovsek. I'm the Chief of Medicine here at St. Joe's, um, and I'm delighted to welcome you all this morning to our St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton Medical Grand Rounds. Bring up the next slide. Um, so as always, we do uh, need to acknowledge the land on which we gather. And uh, today we acknowledge that St. Joseph Healthcare Hamilton sits on the traditional territories of the Mississaugas and the Haudenosaunee nations and is within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. This is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent indigenous nations and peoples Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. And as I look out the window uh, on this beautiful sunny day, albeit cold, uh, you know, we remember that Canada is a very young country, but people have lived on these lands for thousands of years, and we need to respect uh, their history uh, and wisdom. And we'll bring up the next slide. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, very happy to uh, welcome our speakers today, Rebecca Amer and Zane Chagla, and I am going to uh, hand things over to our Infectious Diseases Head of Service, uh, Philippe El Halou, to do proper introductions. This is a combined round uh, where, where we have uh, respirology and infectious disease represented, so we usually do have the heads of service uh, doing the introductions, but Rebecca Amer is our uh, respirology head of service. So rather than have her introduce herself, uh, we've got the we've got uh, our strong team here. So over to you, Philippe. So Dr. Rebecca Amer completed her internal medicine and respirology postgrad training at McMaster University. She obtained her master's in uh, pharmacology at the University of Toronto. She's an associate professor in the division of respirology and for the last eight years has been the director of the Adult Respirology Training Program. She is the president, she was the president of the SGH Medical Association, Medical Staff Association in 2014, and she is the current head of service of respirology at St. Joe's. Zane Chagla, I think, needs no introduction. You know him from CBC. I think I knew that Zane had achieved some fame when one of my high school friends from Montreal goes, do you know this doctor, Zane Chagla? I think he works at your hospital. And I'm like, no, I have no idea who Zane Chagla is. <laughs> Obviously, COVID has sort of put him to the stratosphere and he's worked very hard at delivering both <laughs> antibody treatments as well as novel therapies for COVID and has helped us through the infection control challenges that we've had over the last couple of years. Uh, both Rebecca and Zane have been running this combined respirology ID clinic and they'll be discussing more of the challenges and what cases they're seeing at that during this round and we'll open it up at the end for questions and without further ado I think Rebecca's starting is that correct? That's right. Thanks, uh, thanks Phil and we have no conflicts of interest to disclose and thank you for the kind introduction that's often the way our clinics start and I introduce myself and it's kind of boring. I'm Dr. Amer, and then the patients automatically turn to Zane and say, oh, Dr. Shagla, we see you on the news, you know, every Friday, and we get our tea, and we watch you on the news, and, you know, it's 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 the superstar and uh, and uh, Rebecca Amer, so um, it's a lot of fun, and uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, so our objectives today, uh, we're going to do just a brief introduction of the Respirology Infectious Diseases Clinic, how it came to be, um, I will do uh, some case-based um, discussions of patients that we've encountered in the clinic over the years, um, and then I'll turn it over to, to Zane, who will um, do a brief overview of the approach um, to managing pulmonary aspergillosis, and then we'll just touch uh, briefly upon our ongoing uh, post-COVID um, pulmonary disease uh, study, the COREG study. Um, which we um, uh, are PIs um, in collaboration with other colleagues in respirology and radiology in the city. Okay, so over the last 10 to 15 years, um, I would say, at least dating back to when I was a fellow, St. Joe's has really been fertile ground for several combined multidisciplinary clinics um, with colleagues in rheumatology, hematology, nephrology, internal medicine, and other disciplines all working together to provide excellence in clinical care. Um, some of the Firestone uh, combination clinics that you may be aware of um, are, include the Respirology Rheumatology Clinic, the Resp Room uh, Renal Clinic, which happens, I believe, once a month 
We now have a multidisciplinary sarcoidosis clinic. There's a vasculitis clinic in conjunction with rheumatology. We've got the lung diagnostic assessment program, which involves rest, thoracic surgery, and soon to be interventional pulmonology. And we've got the mycobacterial TB clinic that's um, co-run um, by respirology and infectious diseases. Um, nephrology also um, has partnered with ID and they have their peri uh, uh, transplant uh, clinic, um, which uh, Dr. Shagla uh, participates in to manage the care of the uh, renal transplant patients. And really all of these um, combined multidisciplinary clinics at St. Joe's have provided an opportunity for excellence in clinical care, education and research opportunities. So much like the founding fathers who created the, the Constitution of the United States um, back in the 1700s, um, in 2018, a small working group uh, consisting of um, myself, Zane, uh, Phil, Kevin, um, and some of our clinical fellows as well at the time, Jane Turner and um, Dale Kalina uh, in respirology and ID respectively, we, we convened um, and developed a working group uh, to help develop a vision for the Respirology ID Clinic um, at Firestone um, after the realization that a lot of us shared um, multiple patients um, and we're managing them uh, independently and thought it would be an opportunity for us to manage them together, much like our, our um, other, um, the other St. Joe's clinics that, that I've already uh, mentioned. So we created a working document outlining the goals and objectives for this clinic in line with the, the mission and vision of St. Joseph's Hospital. We wanted this to be an example of multidisciplinary patient-centered care, allowing for enhanced learning opportunities for residents and the respirology, infectious diseases, and internal medicine programs. Um, the clinical focus of our clinic uh, includes the diagnosis and management of complex bacterial, fungal, and non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections. Referrals come from many sources, including other colleagues in respirology um, here at St. Joe's um, across the city and um, in our Lynn as well. Uh, referrals also come from our colleagues in infectious diseases, thoracic surgery, nephrology, and internal medicine. And we often are, are asked to provide second opinions for complex patients. Um, one of the benefits of our RESPID clinic is that we have timely access to diagnostic imaging and uh, fiber optic bronchoscopy as part of our clinic which helps to coordinate uh, patient care in a timely manner. And we also wanted this um, to be an opportunity to engage in meaningful clinical research with other disciplines. And we, Zane and I have been fortunate enough to collaborate with other colleagues in respirology across the city and radiology um, in a post COVID um, study examining the long-term uh, pulmonary effects um, of the virus, um, of the COVID-19 virus. And, and uh, Zane will touch on that uh, a little bit later on in our presentation. So I'm now, um, and with permission from some of our patients, um, I'm going to present some of our founding patients uh, who were um, part of a group of patients who sparked our idea uh, for this clinic um, back in 2018. So our first patient is uh, Miss TN, and she is a 45-year-old woman that I was actually following following my own general respirology clinic um, who was referred with chronic cough. Just quickly, she did have a history of bronchiectasis um, based on a, a prior um, chest x-ray and a CT um, that was done um, by her family physician. She also had um, a history of resolved uh, hepatitis A infection, which was remote. She um, immigrated from Vietnam in 2004, had the BCG vaccine during infancy, was a non-smoker, self-employed, and had no um, occupational um, uh, exposure history. Um, just quickly, it's kind of hard to summarize all of the patient's um, uh, pertinent um, past medical history and history um, of presenting illness because we've been following them for several years. But in, in brief, she initially presented with a history of productive cough associated with brown sputum and no hemoptysis at that time. She had no other respiratory symptoms, no dyspnea, wheezing, or effort intolerance. And she had no um, history of immunosuppression. So um, she had had previous negative HIV, Hep B, and C um, screening. And at the, that time, she had no constitutional signs or symptoms and no evidence of an underlying connective tissue disorder. So this is a chest x-ray from June 2018, which demonstrates uh, subtle changes in the right mid-zone with a tubular opacity likely representing uh, some mucus impaction outlined there by the yellow arrow. Um, there is no evidence of consolidation, cavitary disease, uh, or nodularity elsewhere in the lung parenchyma. Uh, 
She subsequently underwent a CT chest, um, which uh, demonstrated subtle mucus impaction in the right middle lobe outlined by the yellow arrow on the left, um, seen on the axial images. Um, and there was also evidence of localized bronchiectomy bronchiectasis seen um, in the second uh, axial image as outlined by the blue arrow with no other parenchymal changes uh, evident. So bronchiectasis, I think most of you know, is defined as an abnormally widened and thickened airway, which is non-tapering, and this can be further divided into cylindrical, varicose, or, sub, uh, or cystic subtypes. Coronal imaging here uh, clearly dem demonstrates the localized nature of, of her bronchiectasis, all, uh, all of which, which is um, located in the right middle lobe, sparing the right upper lobe and uh, right lower lobe altogether. So she subsequently uh, submitted sputum cultures, which were all negative for bacterial, fungal, and mycobacterial infection. We also completed a, a diagnostic workup for causes of her bronchiectasis, uh, including repeat serology for HIV, a CTD uh, screen, which was all negative, and there was no evidence of uh, immunoglobulin deficiencies, and her CBC uh, was normal with a normal differential as well. She also underwent pulmonary function testing, and there was no evidence of obstruction or restriction in her gas transfer uh, was, was normal as well. So it was overall a normal pulmonary function test. So this is a, um, so given the presence of her, uh, her bronchiectasis with negative sputum cultures and persistent productive cough with bronch sputum, we advanced her to bronchoscopy. And this was um, on the left, uh, an image of her first um, bronchoscopy, specifically demonstrating the right middle lobe, uh, the medial and lateral segments, which are outlined by um, B5 and B4 uh, respectively, and the superior segment of the right lower lobe, which is outlined by B6. Um, so you can um, see the, on, on the right-hand um, part of the slide, you can actually see um, the bronchial anatomy from the perspective of the bronchoscopist with the right middle lobe um, identified uh, by the yellow arrow. Actually, sorry, the yellow arrow there is the right medial segment on her image. And the, the second yellow arrow is identifying the right middle lobe from the perspective of the bronchoscopist. Um, and then again, I've included a CT image, it's not hers. Again, outlining a nice um, view of the right middle lobe um, segmental bronchi on CT scan. So back to Ms. TN, um, close evaluation of all available segments um, bilaterally really, really revealed no abnormalities other than focal narrowing of the right middle lobe, specifically the uh, medial segment of the right middle lobe outlined by the yellow uh, arrow or B5. And really that, that sort of blockage there uh, reflects uh, mucus impaction, which was easily aspirated. And then we were able to, um, to enter the medial segment of the right middle lobe. There was no evidence of an endobronchial lesion, uh, tumor, or any other uh, clear airway abnormality. It was just very narrowed. And um, what you're seeing there is mucus that we were able to remove. Uh, and then BAL uh, from the right middle lobe, a bronchoalveolar lavage, uh, was sent for culture, AFB, mycology, and cytology. So her BAL um, demonstrated um, growth of fungal elements um, and Aspergillus flavus, which is a filamentous fungus that can be an opportunistic pathogen leading to invasive and non-invasive aspergillosis in humans was isolated. Um, she was followed in my clinic um, and we decided to um, not initiate any treatment with antifungal therapy. We weren't sure if this was, was a pathogen or not at that time. Um, and given stability of her symptoms and her brown symptoms seemed to resolve on its own, um, we decided to, to follow her longitudinally uh, for several months. However, her cough um, returned once again, and she did develop um, this brown um, sputum. And so at that point, I decided to refer her to um, myself and Dr. Shaglet and the Respirology ID Clinic really to get um, an ID perspective of whether or not um, we should proceed with treatment of, as of her Aspergillus uh, flavus that we isolated on BAL. So she was seen in April 2019 in our combined clinic, um, at which point the decision was made um, to start her on voriconazole. Um, and this was um, really a, a decision based on her uh, recurrent clinical symptoms, the radiographic findings, and the microbiologic findings of uh, suggestive of aspergillosis. Uh, so she, Ms. Tien tolerated therapy for about a month. Um, however, unfortunately, she developed some visual changes and elevated uh, transaminases, uh, and therefore we terminated treatment with voriconazole 
and she was subsequently um, switched over to posaconazole. But with this agent, um, after about a month, she developed a severe uh, flu-like um, illness uh, consisting of conjunctivitis, fever, uh, sore throat, and arthralgias. We did an NPS at that time. It was negative for viral infections, stopped her medication. Those symptoms uh, resolved. And then because of her intolerance to voriconazole, we decided to rechallenge her with posiconazole. And unfortunately, she developed the same symptoms again. Um, and uh, therefore, we uh, deemed this to be a hypersensitivity reaction to posiconazole, which is rarely described um, uh, in the literature associated with, with posiconazole uh, specifically. So even though she had approximately two to two and a half months of treatment um, combined voriconazole and posiconazole, um, her, her symptoms seemed to improve for a few months. Uh, however, they then returned um, in September of 2019, at which point we started her on isavuconazole, um, and she was on this therapy initially for approximately three months. So encouragingly, uh, Ms. Tian tolerated uh, this azole uh, quite well, actually, without any side effects. Her liver enzymes uh, were normal, and we were following them very closely. Um, and unfortunately, once we, we stopped the isavuconazole after three months, her symptoms seemed to recur um, several times and she ended up over the next couple of years on recurred courses of isavuconazole. So the patient underwent a, a second bronchoscopy in 2021, given recurrence of her symptoms, including hemoptys hemoptysis now, despite um, several courses of, of isavuconazole. There was persistent narrowing of the right middle lobe as we had seen uh, before in 2018, raising the possibility of, of right middle lobe syndrome, which is defined as recurrent or chronic obstruction or infection of the right middle lobe due to um, uh, obstructive causes such as an endobronchial lesion or extrinsic co compression from an extra luminal um, mass or lymph nodes. Non-obstructive causes of right middle lobe syndrome um, include inflammatory processes and defects in bronchial anatomy and, and uh, impaired collateral ventilation. Radiographic features of right middle lobe syndrome commonly um, include um, collapse of the right middle lobe. However, this can sometimes be uh, missed on x-ray or CT imaging because it can be um, intermittent and, and not always persistent um, atelectasis or collapse of the right middle lobe. One can also see um, a localized bronchiectasis of the right middle lobe, and this syndrome can also affect the lingula um, in, the, in the left hemithorax as well. So at the time of this bronchoscopy, uh, there was again narrowing, there was mucus in the medial segment, we easily aspirated it, there was no endobronchial lesion, uh, and her BAL this time was um, significant for aspergillus fumigatus, and she was therefore restarted on um, a repeat course of isavuconazole for an additional three months. She underwent uh, CT, uh, repeat CT chest just recently in February, and this shows uh, persistent bronchiectasis um, with bronchial wall thickening and mucus plugging in the, in the right middle lobe is seen on the axial view on the right outlined by the blue arrow. And the coronal view on the right hand, uh, on the right hand uh, part of the slide, um, once again demonstrates evidence of bronchiectasis outlined by the yellow arrow, which is progressed slightly as compared to uh, earlier CT imaging. Of note, um, you can see again, there were no other parenchymal changes elsewhere in the lungs uh, with focal and persistent changes in the right middle lobe with recurrent isolation of aspergillus on BAL and sputum cultures. So given the presence of her symptoms coupled with recurrent isolation of aspergillus on BAL and sputum necessitating repeated courses of antifungal um, agents, some of which she didn't tolerate, uh, the patient um, was recently uh, referred to our colleagues in thoracic surgery for consideration of right middle lobe resection. Um, along the way, we had also instituted um, some uh, uh, pulmonary hygiene techniques like aerobica and nebulized saline, some of which she, she tolerated and didn't. Um, throughout her, um, her, uh, her uh, trajectory as well, we, there were some issues with, with funding for the isavuconazole, which was making it increasingly more difficult for us to um, access that, that uh, medication. And Dr. Shago will talk a little bit more um, about that. Uh, when he gets into the management of, of pulmonary aspergillosis. So she's now in the hands of thoracic surgery uh, being co-managed by our clinic as well. And she's undergoing repeat CT imaging and bronchoscopy um, uh, by thoracics to determine the next steps um, in the management of her chronic pulmonary aspergillosis, secondary to the possibility of underlying right middle lobe syndrome with resultant bronchiectasis. 
And really, in summary, um, Ms. Tien's case nicely illustrates how multiple issues were being investigated in our clinic, including management of bronchiectasis, pulmonary aspergillosis, and possible right middle lobe syndrome, um, possibly necessitating uh, surgical intervention. So our next patient, Mr. E.B., um, is another patient who uh, I started seeing in my general respirology clinic in, in, 2000 and in, in 2018 in regards to his, um, his COPD. Um, he had moderate uh, COPD with an FEV1 of 62% of predicted, uh, 1.92 liters. He had a remote history of colon cancer. It was stage three, and he underwent colon resection in 2011 with no adjuvant chemo radiotherapy at that time and was currently in remission. Um, so I've been following him uh, for a couple of years in my general rest clinic for his COPD, and then he developed an acute on chronic cough, no hemoptysis, no constitutional symptoms, and he subsequently underwent um, chest x-ray and CT imaging. Um, and this is Mr. Eby's um, CT chest from December 2016, which demonstrated um, mucus impaction of the right um, upper lobe segmental bronchus, as outlined by the yellow arrow. Um, this mucus impacted airway was surrounded by ground glass opacities, measuring approximately 2.6 by 4.9 by 3.7 centimeters, um, which was new as compared to the CT in 2015. And this um, area of ground glass opacity uh, um, surrounding the impacted airway is outlined nicely by the, the blue arrow there on the right-hand uh, axial view. There was no evidence of endobronchial mass, um, nor is there any evidence of uh, uh, suspicious looking lymphadenopathy. Um, also evident, and you can see in the uh, left upper lobe was stable by apical uh, pleural thickening with associated left apical uh, parenchymal scarring seen on previous CT imaging and all of, all of that was, was stable. So at that point in time, given his history of, of, of smoking, he was an ex-smoker and his remote history of colon cancer, I referred him to the Lung Diagnostic Assessment Program, given um, my concern that this could uh, reflect an underlying malignancy. Um, and at that time, um, the uh, thoracic surgery team in the Lung Diagnostic Assessment um, Program opted to follow him uh, closely with serial CT imaging uh, over the next um, uh, 12 to 18 months given that I had already performed a bronchoscopy, which was negative for both infection and malignancy. So through LDAP, um, he had a follow-up CT in November uh, 2017, which showed a new um, well-circumscribed well uh, one centimeter uh, non-calcified mass within the anterior segment of the right upper lobe, um, delineated by the yellow arrow on the left-hand uh, um, axial um, image. Um, in the region of um, endobronchial impaction um, and the ground glass attenuation that we saw on his imaging from 2016, now outlined by the blue arrow within the posterior segment of the right upper lobe remained stable. So those changes remained stable. However, there was a new mass in the right upper lobe delineated by the yellow arrow. So we again, um, in consultation with our colleagues in thoracics and we work with closely, um, we, we saw him again in our combined, we saw him in our combined clinic. I actually referred him to, to myself and Dr. Shegla, um, at which point we repeated a, a third bronchoscopy um, with BAL and brushings um, done um, involving the right upper lobe uh, segment to rule out infection and or malignancy. Once again, cultures and cytology were negative. At this point, um, the decision was made between our team of thoracics to advance him um, to a transthoracic needle biopsy, uh, which is performed by interventional radiology. And this was done of the new one centimeter right upper lobe nodule, which showed evidence of granulomatous inflammation with necrosis, with presence of fungal hyphae suggestive of aspergillus. So given his tissue findings from the TTMB, we started him on voriconazole, which eventually was discontinued after two months due to uh, visual toxicity. So he, he was on Vori for two months. We stopped it due to the visual changes. The visual changes resolved. And actually, he remained clinically stable uh, for several months. Um, and his cough had gotten better. He had no interval hemoptysis or new symptoms. And we were following him uh, conservatively in the clinic at that point in time. Um, however, he developed worsening cough once again um, in July 2020. And he underwent a repeat CT in October of 2020. Uh, which showed interval increase in the, in the focal um, nodular consolidation secondary to the 
coalescence of multiple small nodules and ground glass opacities previously seen on the imaging dating back to, see, um, to 2016. So this was the, the, the first area um, of concern, which was stable a, a year earlier. The other mass um, or nodule was biopsied, and that um, showed evidence of aspergillus um, infection. Now, this original mass was, was starting to grow, but other mass was no longer seen. Uh, so two months of worry, um, it looked like it, it actually caused cessation of that earlier nodule, um, but the, the initial mass there um, had, had gotten um, larger, so that mucus impaction with the GGO at all coalesced to form this mass. So at this point, we requested um, repeat sputum cultures, uh, which now demonstrated growth of aspergillus fumigatus, whereas this was not the case on previous um, uh, sputum uh, uh, cultures or BAL samples from his prior bronchoscopies. We made the diagnosis uh, through a tissue um, uh, diagnosis through his uh, transthoracic needle biopsy. So again, Mr. Evie was started on boriconazole, and he remained on this. He pushed on through for a good three months, despite having some mild visual effects again, um, which resolved after completion of therapy. And he actually did well uh, once again, um, uh, following uh, treatment with worry. However, uh, midway through 2021, he had recurrence of his cough. Uh, we advanced him to a, a fourth bronchoscopy uh, to determine if this was recurrence of his infection um, and again to screen for malignancy given, given that he remained um, at risk for this given his, his uh, significant history of smoking and his history of remote colon cancer. So again, uh, BAL and brushings of the right upper lobe uh, were negative for infection and malignancy. Um, we advanced him to a second transthoracic needle biopsy of that enlarging mass, um, the coalescence of the GGOs and the mucus impaction and the nodules um, in the area uh, of concern. And at this point in time, there was no evidence of fungal elements or uh, there was no um, growth of aspergillus. However, cytology was positive for a squamous cell carcinoma. So at this point in time, he was re-referred to our colleagues in, um, in LDAP. Um, and additional investigations, staging investigations, uh, thankfully didn't demonstrate any local or distant metastases. So given that this was deemed to be stage 2B non-small cell lung carcinoma, squamous cell, he successfully underwent a right upper lobe lobectomy um, in May 2021 with adjuvant chemotherapy. He did have a follow-up CT in July 2021 post lobectomy, which only showed some mild ground glass opacities in the right middle and right lower lobes with no evidence of uh, malignancy rec uh, recurrence at that time. So his uh, poor Mr. E.B., his story continues post lung resection in that he, he did develop worsening cough and some mild hemoptysis in December 2021. Uh, we resubmitted sputum samples, and this time um, it demonstrated growth of both uh, Mycobacterium avium and uh, Mycobacterium uh, cumamotensi, which the latter of which was not felt to be a pathogen. It was probably, um, and we deemed it to be a, a, a colonizer. Um, however, given his persistent clinical symptoms, his underlying COPD and recurrent history of cancer, uh, coupled with the positive um, uh, mycobacterium avium on sputum, we opted to start him on triple therapy with azithromycin, ethanvitol, and rifampin in February 2022. So as in our first patient, uh, Ms. Tian, Mr. Eb's um, case also illustrates um, how multiple issues are being addressed in our clinic including management of COPD initially, initially pulmonary aspergillosis, squamous cell carcinoma requiring surgical intervention, and most recently treatment of an underlying non-tuberculous mycobacterial infection post-lung resection. Working uh, together, respirology and ID, and combining our perspectives uh, allowed for a, 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 a comprehensive and stepwise approach to both of these patients' care, which may have been more fragmented and difficult um, had we uh, been seeing them independently. And it's not uncommon to see atypical uh, infections in patients with underlying structural lung disease, such as um, obstructive airways disease, bronchiectasis, and cancer, and vice versa, which makes a, a team-based approach ideal so the appropriate diagnostics and treatments are completed in a strategic and time-sensitive manner. So at this point in time, I'm going to hand it over to, to my colleague, Dr. Shagla, um, who's going to um, do a brief overview of the approach to uh, management of pulmonary aspergillosis. Hi, everyone. Uh, so thank you for that. And I think uh, Dr. Amer recognizes and, and highlights two very different cases where it can't be understated how much the, the overlap between the ID and the respirology issues um, 
you know, the need for a multidisciplinary approach really did benefit those patients, you know, especially in that last example, someone going from aspergillus to cancer back to another infectious etiology, there would have been a lot of time wasted working up recurrences of the underlying disease um, uh, had there not been a multidisciplinary approach um, uh, to, to that patient's care. Uh, so, you know, I, just because we've been talking a lot about aspergillus and, and really aspergillus outside of the typical uh, uh, major immunocompromised population, I just want to review a little bit on pulmonary aspergillosis in terms of kind of the, the spectrum of disease, as well as um, uh, therapeutic options that are available for aspergillosis, uh, and then talking a little bit about, again at the end about our COREG data. Uh, and so when we talk about aspergillus, which is a, you know, a pathogen we all inhale on a day-to-day -day basis is, you know, mold that's present in the environment. It's, it's present in our walls and, and other uh, settings. Uh, we really see that the aspergillus spectrum of disease can go anywhere from colonization. So just, you know, airways that have aspergillus within mucus or were, were aspirated at the time of bronchoscopy or at sputum collection, or occasionally even at the level of the laboratory at, at NERR. Uh, and then you see this spectrum between immunologic dysfunction and invasive disease. So, you know, angio invasion, attacking uh, um, or invading through alveolar cells into uh, pulmonary circulation uh, as immunologic dysfunction gets much more profound. And we see this in uh, people who have acute myeloid leukemia, people who have uh, bone marrow transplantation, people who are chronically neutropenic, uh, solid organ transplant patients, particularly lung transplants and heart transplants. Uh, and then, you know, as you start getting towards more immune hyperactivity, i.e. the immune dysfunction is not there. And in fact, the response is much more of an allergic response. We see, you know, the classic allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis and, and severe asthma with fungal sensitization. But there is this middle zone of chronic pulmonary aspergillosis, aspergilloma, and aspergillus bronchitis, where uh, you see not as much lung damage, you see relatively intact immune systems, but you see, you know, a structural abnormality in the lung that often leads to chronic proliferation of the aspergillus, uh, as, as you can see in these two examples with TN and EB, where they had underlying uh, parenchymal problems that, that then led to aspergillus becoming an issue in their context. And this also goes two ways, that the uh, you know, as you start seeing more invasive spectrum of disease, particularly angio invasion and hemoptysis, um, you, you, you start thinking that there is more an, of an immunologic defect than, uh, than has been prior described. It's harder to just contribute that to underlying COPD or underlying bronchiectasis in that sense. Uh, next slide. Uh, and so this is another way of taking a look through a pathologic lens into uh, aspergillosis. So we start with, again, the classic invasive pulmonary aspergillosis, where you see angio invasion, dissemination, again, are typical in our bone marrow transplants, AML patients, solid organ transplants with high levels of immunosuppression, occasionally in other immunosuppressed populations. Uh, and you see, you know, a hemorrhage and, and necrosis, and, and it really is just prolonged and profound neutropenia. You can see this kind of middle picture among some individuals that have lower level immunosuppression where they have more invasive pattern, not necessarily angio invasion, or they may have pyogranulomatous in inflammation, but with some degree of necrosis and cavitation. And you see this in CGD, those in uh, on corticosteroid therapy, those in, with HIV, non-neutropenic stem cell transplant patients, graft versus host disease, again, some of the lower level solid organ transplant patients in terms of an immunosuppression. Uh, and again, the onset is weeks to months here. It, it, again, more of a chronic picture. And then finally, when we start talking about these populations that I think we've seen through the clinic more, these are patients without hyphae in the tissue, where it is very localized, but chronic, including aspergillomas and aspergillosis. Um, and again, you see no angio invasion. It's usually confined to a pre-existing lung cavity or pre-existing area of lung damage. 
Uh, and again, these patients really have minor immunologic deficits. They're often immunocompetent or functionally immunocompetent. Um, and their pattern of disease is, again, months to years. As, as some of these present, as we saw, as just a solitary pulmonary nodule that is only worked up in the, in, in, and uh, diagnosed and, and really asymptomatic, uh, other than uh, the, the cancer workup that often ensues, especially as these are patients with underlying respirology, uh, uh, parenchymal lung disease. Next slide. There are also some other syndromes to be aware of in terms of pulmonary aspergillosis, uh, um, post-influenza, and particularly now post-COVID-associated aspergillosis, or TAPA, uh, where patients who are critically ill with, uh, with um, influenza or uh, COVID-19 uh, that uh, often have an ICU stay or prolonged ventilation, uh, especially in, in uh, COVID in association with some of the immunosuppressive therapies that are given for severe COVID patients, where these patients may develop parenchymal lung changes that are not consistent with COVID-19. It's often a part of the differential diagnosis as we talk about COVID-19 organizing pneumonia to rule out. Uh, and again, you know, especially in these patients has a very poor prognostic outcome. We certainly have seen a couple here at St. Joe's as part of our two years. And, and again, this is a recognized entity now uh, uh, of that kind of COVID-19 patient that's not improving weeks to months after their, their COVID diagnosis, especially those who are critically ill. We have pleural base disease, and this is often in the context of um, uh, patients with uh, bronchopleural fistulas, where, uh, you know, invasion of the pleural space can often lead to uh, uh, pleural based aspergillus disease. Uh, these are often treated with not only um, microbiologic uh, um, uh, uh, eradication uh, with therapy, but sometimes even with radical surgeries such as thoracic windows and, and drainage uh, in order to, to get control. And then we have this uh, tracheobronchitis spectrum that's often seen in lung transplant patients and patients with HIV. Uh, and again, uh, often not much parenchymal disease, but the isolation of perilla and sputum uh, without, with uh, demonstration of aspergillosis. Next slide. And so, you know, generally, again, the approach to these patients was, you know, is this expected? Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, based on their parenchymal lung history or their immunosuppression, uh, was this an expected outcome given everything? Uh, what is the degree of immunologic dysfunction? And again, not every immune suppressed patient is the same. There are patients with lower level of immunosuppression that will get more IPA without angio invasion, whereas people at more profound states of neutropenia will get more immunologic dysfunction leading to angio invasion. What's the degree of structural lung change? Uh, is there another etiology or optimization? And, and you know, again, it's, this is especially in that colonization compartment when we start seeing aspergillus being isolated from clinical sp uh, specimens. You know, is it really the aspergillus that's causing the issue uh, or is there another etiology altogether? And, and I think Mr. Eby is a great example here where a uh, nodule, uh, you know, that we thought was aspergillus uh, ended up being squamous cell cancer. And, and again, keeping the differential still open, even in the, the isolation of aspergillus. Is the pattern of disease compatible? Do we see parenchymal changes? Uh, do we see mucus impaction? Do we see in more of the invasive spectrum evidence of cavitation and nodularity? And then will treatment make a difference? Uh, what are the risks and benefits of treatment for these patients? Uh, and again, it's not simply just um, pharmacologic risks, but uh, uh, unfortunately even economic risks in that sense. Uh, and again, looking at disease optimization from another standpoint, particularly people with parenchymal lung changes, is there any way to optimize their disease? Next slide. And so I'll, I'll go through this example one more time. I'm not going to go through a lot of the patient's details, but this was a, 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 a female that uh, had a prior history of moderate to severe asthma who presented back in 2017 with this large cavitary lesion that was essentially aspergillus. It had actually eroded through a bronchial artery uh, and was leading to fairly profound hemoptysis and, and unfortunately had to undergo a lung resection uh, as part of her management. Um, at the time, there wasn't really a clear etiology. They thought maybe there was some, some degree of, again, airway changes from the asthma that had led to aspergillus, although, you know, it was not typical of obviously the allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis pattern. Uh, I think the next slide is her CT scan. Uh, 
um, but you know, a significant degree of cavitation uh, and a, a significant amount of uh, parenchymal destruction, which again is not necessarily in keeping with someone uh, at the level of just kind of chronic pulmonary aspergillosis and structural lung disease. And in fact, a couple of years later in seeing this individual, they had a recurrence of their aspergillus and a large cavitary lesion that enlarged with time basically, uh, that again was pure growth of aspergillus in that context. And again, you can just see the level of parenchymal lung destruction that is done from this, uh, this lesion, uh, as well as hemoptysis as part of the clinical pattern, and, and really triggers that thought of, you know, I'm not in the pattern of disease where we can just kind of attribute this to structural lung disease. This is not just a localized infection associated with aspergilloma. There is a lot of parenchymal lung destruction done here. There's hemoptysis and evidence of angio invasion. And in fact, this triggered a secondary immunodeficiency workup for this individual, even though blood counts were normal, immunoglobulin levels were normal. Uh, you know, there wasn't an overt uh, immunodeficiency, although this person had had a couple of other weird infectious issues in the past. And in fact, on genetic testing, this individual had a uh, STAT3 mutation uh, that's often associated with Job syndrome or hyper IgE and neutropenia and would really, or, or functional neutropenia, which would really explain this clinical picture of persistent aspergillosis. In fact, people in that uh, spectrum of disease and in, in Job's and, and uh, uh, CGD often get serious issues with aspergillus, mycotic aneurysms, lots of bleeding. And in fact, part of their management is lifelong uh, anti-fungal uh, therapy to reduce these complications. And again, you know, this was a nice example of going backwards to say, this is not fitting the clinical picture of someone with structural lung disease and aspergillus. There is a lot of invasion here that isn't explained by just their underlying history and really triggered that, that look back to say, is there an underlying immunodeficiency? Next slide. Uh, quickly, I just want to mention some of the treatment options that Dr. Amer had mentioned uh, for aspergillus, uh, knowing that there are a number of other drugs on the market that have come over the last couple of years. We'll talk quickly uh, about the azoles. I will quickly mention echinocandins and amphotericin in the fact that they are um, less uh, 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 optimal therapy in the treatment of aspergillus. Echinocandins have a higher failure rate than azoles uh, and amphotericin, again, with the toxicity, but also, again, with a slightly higher failure rate, even uh, in the largest uh, RCT between amphotericin and voriconazole. Um, uh, you know, is also a, a treatment of salvage as compared to a, a first line therapy. Uh, next slide. Our standard of care is voriconazole, and again, based on a 2002 randomized control trial comparing voriconazole to amphotericin in the treatment of aspergillosis, where there was a mortality benefit as well as a significant reduction in side effect profile with a, a voriconazole therapy. Voriconazole is generally pretty well tolerated despite being a, a bit of a dirty drug. Um, there are some initial neurologic manifestations, especially associated with the loading dose as, as levels are quite high, uh, and people often say they have vivid dreams or floaters, uh, uh, visual kind of abnormalities. These do settle down typically within a week as, as drug levels start coming down to steady state. Um, uh, we obviously worry about hepatitis. There are a significant number of drug-drug interactions associated with voriconazole, so uh, again, to be war watched for. Long-term voriconazole use can occasionally lead to osteotitis. It is a rare manifestation um, uh, lead, uh, due to the, the fluorination of the molecule in calcium deposition, uh, and again, is really you know, seen in, in use over six months to a year. Uh, QT prolongation, especially along with other QT prolonging agents, and then photosensitivity. And in fact, the case I just went through, uh, voriconazole uh, and photosensitivity have been a large part of the, the issue. And, and this person is fairly debilitated by how photosensitive they become to the drug. And so, uh, again, it's something to counsel people about, particularly at this time of year and people with lighter skin tones. Um, it is fairly expensive. And again, this is a generic drug that is still ridiculously expensive on the market. Um, it is $26 for a 200 milligram tablet. And as we talk about therapeutic options of three months and longer, you know, this is now looking at something like 
60 to $70 a day for three months, uh, you know, it, it can very much take uh, a toll. Uh, this is available via ODB and limited use code, but, uh, but for those who kind of are in that middle zone between not having ODB and not having a private drug plan, uh, it can be a fairly uh, um, impossible uh, acquisition for those individuals when they're, when they're paying hundreds of dollars a day. Um, Voriconazole levels are available. Uh, these are uh, definitely associated in clinical studies with clinical failure if levels are lower and toxicity if levels are higher. These should be measured on treatment at least once for individuals, especially with altered pharmacokinetic profiles, and especially as you're making medication changes, dose changes, or if there's physiologic changes or interfering medications, then serial testing may be warranted. We can do this testing through St. Joe's. Uh, and, uh, although uh, it should be on as a trough level, so it does have to be timed with the, with when that patient is taking their voriconazole. Next slide. Isavuconazole is one of the newer drugs on the market. This is a, again a triazole that's slightly different. Uh, this has actually been available in in the rest of the world for quite some time, but was just approved in Canada in, in 2018, 2019. Um, this actually uh, has a non-inferior trial to voriconazole for the treatment of pulmonary aspergillosis. Uh, this is the Martin's uh, trial that's uh, cited here. Um, uh, so it is, uh, it is a, at least non-inferior to voriconazole in the, in the treatment of uh, invasive aspergillosis is the only drug that's shown that effect. Um, there is less hepatitis associated with isavoconazole. The drug-drug interactions do exist, except it, it is a little bit of a less of a latent um, inducer of, of the cytochrome P450 system. It actually shortens QT interval, so it is a nice adjunct for those patients who are on multiple QT prolonging meds. And in fact, the only contraindication from a cardiac standpoint is congenital short QT syndrome. And it has a more stable pharmacokinetic profile. It often does not require monitoring of levels, given that the absorption and bioavailability are, are pretty stable person to person. The issue here is expense. And so as we talk about a course of oriconazole being $3,000, a course of isavoconazole is somewhere in the range of $30,000. Uh, and uh, these are only approved through exceptional access through the Ontario Drug Benefit Program and, and often require a lengthy back and forth application as we saw with Ms. TN, um, where, where short amounts are being approved at, at a certain time. Uh, as a, you know, editorial, aside from all of this, you know, we've been using such expensive drugs for the treatment of COVID-19 uh, without even blinking an eye, uh, yet, you know, the, the, um, the use of antifungals, which has been, you know, expensive and, and very niche market, uh, our governments have been very poor about making sure that access is equitable and, and that rapid access to, to effective therapy uh, has been equitable uh, and, and has blamed a lot of it on expense, but, but recognizing that other drugs have had significant expense that, again, no one's batted an eyelid for. Next slide. Uh, posiconazole uh, is uh, um, uh, less data as primary treatment. It is there is a single trial recently that did compare it to voriconazole that did show non inferiority. Uh, there's less QT prolongation. It's more of a stable pharmacokinetic profile. It's available as tablets or liquid. Uh, the tablets have a bit more of a stable uh, a dosing schedule, but it is again very expensive in the same ballpark as isavoconazole. And then finally, we have an older drug, an itraconazole. It is a very unstable uh, pharmacokinetic drug and has a very high variability amongst populations and genetics. There are higher rates of clinical failure associated with itraconazole. Um, uh, hepatitis and QT above prolongation are also part of therapy. Uh, there are also issues with the uh, tablets versus liquid. So tablets are actually very poorly absorbed. You need a, a optimally an acidic state in the stomach. Um, so you have to take cola, take it with Coca-Cola and an empty stomach is a, a typical advice. Uh, and uh, uh, people on acid suppressive therapy for their stomach, this can't be used as part of their therapy, given that uh, they don't have the stomach acid to absorb the drug appropriately. There is a liquid formulation. Uh, it's better absorbed, but it tastes terrible. It really, people say it's awful. Uh, and so, you know, we can use that. It is a bit more forgiving in terms of stomach acid and taking it with food. Um, and then there are a, a new set of better absorbed tablets that are available in the United States, but have not been approved in Canada, but may be something that uh, uh, um, we have access to in the coming years and months. Next slide. This is actually one, one trial I want to present, and it, it's exciting in the context of 
um, uh, a large randomized clinical trial for a treatment in uh, in chronic aspergillosis, uh, which is really not a, a common thing. So this is a large clinical trial that was done in India, uh, where uh, clinically assessed individuals with pulmonary aspergillosis were um, uh, um, uh, uh, randomized to a year versus six months of uh, itraconazole here, open label, uh, and then stopped and looked at median relapse-free survival. Uh, and uh, again, you can see here fairly clearly that on the Kaplan-Meier curve that one year of therapy was actually um, uh, um, much better than uh, um, uh, uh, six months and the relapse free survival was 23 months in the one year group versus 18 months, uh, in the, uh, in the six month group. Uh, and again, you know, some hope here, just as an aside that, that more evidence generation in this field, especially duration of therapy, which is an important part of this, um, uh, will likely come out in as, as groups start addressing this. Uh, and this is, this was published in the Lancet, I believe just two to three weeks ago. So, so fairly new data. Uh, next slide. So I'm going to switch topics here and just quickly mention our coreg data before we take questions. So this is a, a, a you know obviously we know that post acute COVID nineteen uh, is a new entity that we have to to uh, learn about. Um, and, uh, um, you know, knowing what radiologic and physiologic measures uh, patients have after their severe COVID-19 or even mild COVID-19 that are complaining of dyspnea uh, is going to help with prognosticating individuals as well as figuring out, uh, again, what their prognosis is. And so this is a collaborative study with radiology, ID, respirology, um, and it's focusing on radiologic and respiratory physiology using uh, low dose CT scans at at three and nine months, as well as full PFTs at three and nine months, as well as clinical assessments in various populations at uh, various levels of disease. This could be the mildest of cases, the asymptomatic cases, patients with uh, mild cases that had post-acute COVID respiratory complaints, uh, and then some of our moderate to severe patients that have required hospitalization. Uh, and, and, you know, certainly there are differences in that. There's also now starting to become vaccinated, unvaccinated populations as part of this. Next slide. And so, you know, and, and Dr. Amer can can also chime in here, but I think we we have, uh, you know, a, a, at least an early set of clinical experiences anecdotally. Um, you know, fibrosis is definitely there, especially those who had ARDS and had prolonged ventilation. Although we've been shocked with a couple of patients that really had, you know, fairly profound ARDS that were almost ECMO dependent that came out of this with very little parenchymal change and, and you know, uh, had, you know, incredible recoveries that were almost at normal. Uh, and so, you know, it's not as simple as saying that every single person that has severe COVID-19 will be left with fibrotic changes. There are some that still escape throughout all of it. I think one thing we noticed very quickly in assessing these patients was that there was a lot of underdiagnosed, undiagnosed, and poorly managed underlying pathology that contributed to symptoms. And a lot of this, we actually could find some radiologic or physiologic evidence of this pre-existing uh, the COVID-19. And so likely, again, these are, these are patients with a mild to moderate asthma that became moderate to severe asthma after their COVID-19. We've seen individuals with occupational lung disease where the COVID-19 likely pushed them over the edge, but had parenchymal abnormalities on imaging that pre-existed the COVID-19 by years. Um, and, you know, uh, again, other syndromes, we've seen autoimmune syndromes, we've seen other issues where uh, not only that, 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 you know, the patient has been put into a box of uh, long COVID and, and that the, the diagnostic workup was closed at that point, uh, but also, as we know, access to care during this last two years has been uh, suboptimal for patients and, and recognizing that sometimes it was just a full general internal medicine medical assessment of that individual uh, that, that led to uh, the, the, the discovery of other etiologies for, for uh, some of those post-acute COVID symptoms. Um, we have seen vaccination being fairly perfective, uh, effective for post-acute COVID symptoms. Um, and in fact, uh, 10 to 15% of individuals, and again, described in the literature that vaccination after the COVID episode may improve some of the post-acute COVID symptoms. And, and there's a lot of work being done in terms of whether or not either chronic um, uh, um, 
aberrant inflammation versus a viral reservoir needing a very effective immune response that isn't acquired by natural infection um, may be a part of the post-acute COVID syndrome. And then finally, there's a lot of need for systematic post-COVID care, including rehabilitation. And I think we are recognizing there are patients that would benefit from cardiopulmonary rehabilitation uh, after their COVID-19 episode. Uh, and unfortunately, access in, in this day and age, especially with the clinical needs that are coming to the pipeline, is, is still limited and, and certainly a, a recognition that that is a, a piece to follow. And I think that's it for us. Uh, and Becky, maybe you want to introduce this uh, this individual here and and uh, and what it meant for us. Thanks, Zane. Um, so, in closing, we thought we'd share one other um, story, of one of our patients' stories, um, with with their permission to highlight one of the many reasons that we, you know, we thought about doing this clinic and 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 really are quite passionate about it. Um, this is this is Natalie and her husband Abel and their their dog Toby. And um, again, with permission, Natalie and Abel have, um, have graciously allowed us to just um, introduce them. Um, and uh, really, they, they've become the ambassadors of our clinic. Um, she's quickly a 32-year-old woman with um, non-CF bronchiectasis. She's got end-stage renal disease on peritoneal dialysis. And she also um, has a seronegative uh, arthritis followed by rheum. We met her about three and a half years ago in our clinic with severe bronchiectasis. And she started off having staph aureus infections. Um, and then she went on to develop um, very difficult to treat multi-drug resistant pseudomonas infections. So we're following her quite closely. Everyone in respirology and ID knows her very well. Nephrology too. Um, all of our fellows um, know, know Nat really well. She required uh, multiple um, advanced um, antibiotics um, and, and recurrent admissions to hospital. Given her rapidly declining lung function over the last year, we referred her to the Lung Transplant Service in Toronto. And to be honest, we weren't sure she was gonna survive her last most recent hospital admission. However, with lots of supports from, from colleagues in RASP, ID, nephrology, critical care, both here and in Toronto, she finally received um, her lung transplant about a month ago and is doing extraordinarily well against all odds post-operatively, currently on hemodialysis now. She will require a renal transplant um, at some time in the future, but for now she'll, she'll remain on dialysis and hopefully she can regain some quality of life following her lung transplant. And really Natalie's journey um, was a result of a tremendous collaborative effort um, across disciplines and cities. And Zane and I are so grateful that um, we've been a small part of her care. Um, and she really unquestionably represents the true essence of our, of our clinic. And we were so grateful to have been a part of her journey. And really that's the case with all of our patients um, that we see in our clinic. And just quickly, I know there's some questions. We just want to acknowledge the, the folks that have made this possible. And importantly, um, uh, our respirology and ID um, residents and our postgrad programs have really been um, great to have in our clinic. And they've rotated through and there's some specialty clinic rotations and they always add a lot of uh, vibrancy and advocacy uh, for our patients. Thoracic surgery and LDAP have been tremendous partners and we work very closely with them infectious diseases. Uh, Phil and Kevin, who were part of the, the, the founding uh, working document uh, way back in 2018 to help us develop this vision. RESP and nephrology colleagues, of course, the Firestone clerical staff who put up with us and our uh, Coreg study um, co-investigators as well. So that's it for us. If there's time for questions, we'd be happy to take them. Thank you so much. Uh, you guys have accomplished a, a lot and um, it sounds like there's been really meaningful impact on individual patients' lives, as well as meaningful impact on, on uh, each of you personally uh, from, from hearing how passionate you are about this work. Um, we do only have two minutes for questions and it looks like Jerry Cox got to the front of the line with actually three different questions. So we'll start with the first one. Is it common for the subspecies of Aspergillus to change in cultures obtained over time? Yeah, I think this is referring to that first case where it became Aspergillus flavus and, and then became Pumigatus. I think this is the, the con complex of she probably, you know, TN probably has an, a, a fairly profound underlying anatomic issue that is just leading to these recurrent infections as compared to this is an infection that that was just undertreated over time. This is a, you know, I, I assume, you know, the spores are just being stuck in her tiny little right middle lobe orifice and, and then propagating at that point. And even with therapy, you know, the anatomic issue still remains at that point. So, so it's, again, it's more indicative that, 
the, the, the anatomy is, is probably contributing a lot to the story as compared to someone with just a single pulmonary lesion that, that isn't as, uh, as uh, anatomically uh, linked to uh, a, a site. That, make, that makes a lot of sense. Um, maybe we'll get to Dr. Cox's second question and then, uh, and then we'll wrap up. Um, I've heard of delivering antifungal therapy via nebulizer or inhaler. Seems attractive given the toxicities your patients developed with PO therapies. Is inhaled therapy on our therapeutic horizon? Yes. Do I go ahead, Becky? Or <laughs> um, so I, I, I believe I, I don't think we have any approved therapies in Canada, but they definitely are on the horizon, and I believe in in development currently. And 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 Zane and Phil can elaborate on this more than I. Um, I believe there's a powdered formulation of of itraconazole that's in development for nebulization. And I, I think I've read about um, potentially an inhaled version of, of Ampho B. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So those are two, I think for NTM, there's also some advances. So uh, inhaled amikacin and inhaled levofloxacin are also uh, drugs that are being developed and, and I think are being marketed in the United States as well. Uh, and so, yeah, this is going to be an interesting spectrum, uh, especially in some of the patients or maintenance or kind of dealing with toxicities or salvage therapy that uh, we may have access to, to um, uh, or inhaled options as part of their, their management spectrum, along with systemic options. All right, fantastic. Um, I've just copied Dr. Cox's last question and I'll send it by email to each of you and I'm sure you'll have a chance to reply to him personally. Um, I really wanna thank uh, you, Zane and Rebecca and as well, Philippe, uh, for, for Rebecca and Zane for presenting, Philippe for uh, co-hosting and introducing um, amazing accomplishments. We're, we're so fortunate to have uh, these highly expert clinics uh, that are so multidisciplinary um, led by clinicians who are extremely passionate, knowledgeable. Um, so thank you. And uh, to everyone who's joined today, uh, have a wonderful day. I wish you all the best. Next week, we'll have Chairs Medical Grand Rounds hosted uh, by Dr. Crowther. Take care. Thank you.